No, I was totally scared of it. I wanted to do it though. I mean, I loved jazz. That's today's guest, composer, educator, and publisher Annie Booth, talking about how even she was scared to improvise back in middle school. Welcome to Music at Insights. I'm leadership trainer and former band director Alan Fire, here with composer and co-college music education program head Steve Shanley. Each episode, Alan and I talk with national thought leaders in music education with practical insights for K-12 music educators. Steve, tell us about our guest. Annie Booth is a versatile and award-winning composer, arranger, and jazz pianist. She has received international recognition for her work as a composer and arranger and has also released six albums as a band leader. Additionally, Annie is a respected jazz educator and is currently on faculty at the University of Denver's Lamont School of Music. In 2023, she and fellow composer-arranger Alan Baylock launched Brava Music Publishing, the only outlet of its kind that supports and champions women composers and arrangers in the field of big band jazz. Find Annie's full bio, show notes, and resources at musicatinsights.com. Alan, what was the takeaway you had from this episode? It's good to have a fresh reminder of the way we can accidentally bring gender into instrument selection and even instrumentation. What about you, Steve? Well, it hadn't even occurred to me until Annie pointed it out. Because we are still living in a world where certain instruments are often associated with certain genders, the inclusion of flutes, violins, and clarinets, for example, in our jazz bands can go a long way to help encourage more female students to develop an appreciation for jazz. Also, I cut out 40 minutes of our conversation for the edited and practical episode we present here. Yeah, and those 40 minutes include some great stories from Annie, as well as the three of us digging a little deeper into philosophical issues. Consider joining our Insider program to hear that unedited version. We think listeners who enjoy behind-the-scenes stories will love it. For now, let's listen to this episode with Annie Booth. Annie Booth, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I'm so delighted to be here. Well, you've just launched an exciting new publishing company featuring compositions and arrangements by female writers. Have you had any statements from people like, well, why do we need a publishing company that excludes men? Why can't you just publish the best music and not care about the gender of the composer? Any statements like that? And how have you responded? My answer to that question is, well, of course, you know, we're we're focused on publishing music at the highest quality. That's what we're doing with Brava Jazz. Every single piece that we've included in our catalog has been especially curated. We need this platform that features female composers and arrangers because they're not being represented by the major publishing houses, if you will, um, in jazz. Our research showed us that these major publishers where um, majority of educators and jazz ensemble leaders are getting their music are um, hosting about 5% or less of their catalog featuring music by women. We know that there's great music being written by women out there. So we thought by creating this platform, it would just increase the visibility, increase the access to their music and inspire young women and uh, of and young men, too, who are playing this music um, to maybe pick up the pen and, and start writing or to dig deeper into it, to find something that they connect with. So now that we have a few more of these resources to be able to find some repertoire that might help diversify our programming, I and others are curious about people like you and your take on the question of how do I know if I'm doing a good enough job with the diversity of my programming? Do I need to have a piece by a female composer on every program or one per year? Or should mm -hmm. I have one concert that is only music by female composers? What do you think is the right way to approach this? And how do we know if we're doing a good job? Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. I think the awareness is the biggest thing, the awareness of diversity, the awareness of looking at your programming, looking at all your past concerts that you've done. Let's say in the past five years, if you've been at the same school or you've been at different schools, how many times was there a woman's name on the list? In an ideal world, we would see 50-50, right? And like I think that would be my goal is that every concert, you know, you're playing five compositions. It's like three by a woman, two by a man. And then maybe the next concert it's flipped. 
doing an all a concert of all music by women is great too. But I personally think just having it fold naturally into the fabric of what you're doing with your program at large is kind of what helps what helps the impact of that diversity. Let's say that I have programmed a piece by a female composer for my upcoming concert. How do you suggest that I approach the gender issue in my rehearsals and in my teaching? Do you think I should draw specific attention to the upper right-hand corner and say, look, this piece was written by someone named Annie, and we Mm. often don't perform music by female composers in our jazz band? Or do I not mention it at all and hope they look you up on Wikipedia and discover that you're female? How how do you suggest we approach that? I think ideally, in, in my ideal world, we wouldn't bring up the gender, but we're not at a place, we're nowhere near yet a place where women are represented in jazz as equally as, as men are. I think um, my approach would be to talk about the gender of the composer and, and just, and, and you know, it doesn't, you don't have to go too deep with it. It doesn't have to be such a big deal. I think even just the fact that a she pronoun will come up, like she wrote this piece inspired by her vacation she took. And, you know, she recommends that the eighth notes are going to be swung and this and that. That and I think does enough, and it and it says it says subliminally to the young women who are in that group, hey, there's someone who's doing this at the highest level, and you get to play their music. You've mentioned Alan Baylock a couple of times, your partner in this endeavor, the famed composer and mm-hmm. director of the North Texas Jazz Program, and also I should mention prior guest on our program. If you haven't checked out his episode, listeners, please do. I thought it was cool that he used some of his clout to help you get Brava Publishing up and running. But that being said, I think there also kind of exists a fine line between a man using his influence to further causes like this Mm -hmm. and crossing over into mansplaining or bossing. So for those men like me, like my co-host, Alan Fire, who want to help, uh, how can we advance these causes in a way that is supportive but we don't come across as micromanaging or trying to take things over ourselves. I think collaborating with women, affirming women, you know, when they, when they have ideas and say, that's a great idea. What she said, let's, let's go with that. You know, there's like little things, you know, situational things like not stepping on the toes of other women, but if your goal is to help lift up, you know, female voices, you know, really deferring to the women and, you know, just communicating and saying, you know, how can I help? How can I lend my skills to help this, this cause? And that's really what Alan has done. His skills, you know, and his immense experience in the world of big band jazz in writing, you know, and and engraving music, he's using that. And it's more a little behind the scenes than kind of what I'm doing, which is a little bit more of kind of the the front front of house person, if you will. So yeah, that's kind of been my big takeaway about the way that Alan's approached it. I think he's had a really nice balance of sensitivity. What about the role of improvisation? My wife, who is middle school band director and loves jazz and teaching jazz, got very interested in this because she noticed that the best players in her jazz band, middle school jazz band, were often the female students. Mm -hmm. They could play their instruments the best, but she couldn't get them to solo. And she wondered if, especially at that age, you know, the middle school boy stereotype, they don't care. Yes. They don't care what they look like. They don't care what people think. It's like, oh, this is fun. I just get to make up stuff. And that the girls are like, no, 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 just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I don't want to risk making a mistake. And then when she interviewed people for her master's degree thesis, a lot of the the females said, yeah, I was terrified to make a mistake improvising, especially because my band director was male. Mm. So have you experienced that either yourself or with others, this genderization of being creative and improvising and not being afraid to make mistakes? Yeah, totally. I think what you were saying about just sort of where young women are at at that stage, that it's a very uh, different <laughs> stage of life, right? Being in middle school, when you first start playing this, you're a lot of young women are hyper aware of what people think about them and how they're coming across. And a lot of times they are the best musicians in the band. That's kind of where the dichotomy is. It's sort of, you know, bizarre. 
I, I wrote my master's thesis about a jazz camp that I developed six years ago here in Denver called Shebop. That's a Shebop, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Shebop Young Women in Jazz Workshop. And we've been doing it for six years, a couple of times a year throughout the state of Colorado. And it's it's really grown into a beautiful thing. So I wrote my master's pedagogical thesis about, you know, I dug into some of the social psychology about women learning male dominated things and specifically things people had written about jazz and jazz education. And then I kind of laid out, you know, my, my, the pedagogy of this workshop that I developed and why it's really, really unique and to kind of help encourage young women to play jazz. And most of the young women who do the Shebop workshop are stark, stark, stark beginners. Like they've been playing in their middle school or high school jazz bands, but they, maybe have never even improvised in those groups and almost every single you know young woman who comes in and is frightened of improvising and says nope I don't want to turn soloing by the end of our weekend they're like they feel the confidence and so what I've just noticed is you know and this is a very specific environment which is really impossible to emulate in the classroom setting but it, it really has to do with like the encouragement and the comfortability and almost like over the top encouragement and comfortability around them. So it's something we talk about at Shivap where it's like, hey, you know, if your neighbor sitting next to you takes a great solo, why don't you just, you know, give them a nudge and say, hey, that was awesome and and kind of encourage. There's also, I mean, obviously then there's kind of like technical things that we can do as educators I think a lot of times directors give too much information about how to improvise. It's like, here's this scale and, you know, play this Dorian scale and, and then, and then it'll just sound good. And I think what I've, what I've discovered as an educator is, you know, really limiting the approach, giving maybe like really not making it about pitch as much as, as rhythm and feeling and expression, maybe giving oh, a couple you're pitches. speaking my languages. Yeah, oh, I'm so excited say. to hear. This has been like my diatribe in Iowa for the last 10 years. I love that. Quit, quit making your kids memorize arpeggios and scales and they know too many notes and not enough ways to play them convincingly. And yes. it just doesn't catch on. And I have a theory for why this is that we can talk about a little later. Oh, I want to hear so that. I'm so sorry for interrupting you, but I am just so excited about No, don't be sorry at all. This. <laughs> because I wish yeah. more people were were thinking that. Please continue. Yeah, I mean, well, that approach to me, I've like I've seen the results in action over the past six years with with Shebop, and then you know, just this is just how I approach teaching young musicians in general. Anytime I'm doing a middle school or a high school uh, workshop you know, it's hard to emulate that in the classroom. And it's, you know, if you're a male director and your band's majority, and it's always the same guys who are volunteering to take the solo, I think my recommendation is try to democratize it as much as possible. So get everyone playing at the same time. One technique I use is I teach everyone in the ensemble a background, a little figure that they're going to play. It's a little Charleston rhythm. And then I'm going to have different people solo over top and they have this support and it feels less like, the spotlight's being shown on them. And it's like, hey, you, look, everyone's looking at you. Because I think a lot of young women are just uncomfortable with that. Obviously, it, you know, they're not a, a behemoth, they're a block, you know, some everyone's different. Some people really feel that urge to improvise. But the further you get with it, when you go from middle school to high school, when you go from high school to college, improv is emphasized even more, right? Um, it's less about the written notes and it's more about improv. So if you don't feel comfortable improvising or you've never have, or you've never been really given the right tools, you're not going to do it anymore. And that's why we see women dropping off, you know, more and more as, as the levels increase. Were you scared to improvise like when you were in middle school or do, do you ever remember a time thinking, nope, just show me the notes I need to play on the piano and I'll play them really well, but don't make me make anything up. No, I was totally scared of it. I wanted to do it though. I can remember like, I mean, I loved jazz. Like I was listening to it organically on my own. My dad's a musician. I was just, I loved it, but I would just freak out. I was, I would get really shy and frozen. My hands would shake, you know, when I was playing. And, you know, for me, I would write out solos. And that's something I recommend for students too. Write out your own solo. Yes. Write out something that you really connect with. You make it up and who cares if it's right? And who cares if it's the right notes? But it's it's your expression and then learn it and then play it for the concert. And the more you do that, the more you just start making up your own stuff. Yeah. I feel like that writing out of solos gets kind of a bad reputation. Yeah. And I like to say, you know, almost everything that Charlie Parker played, he had planned out also. The difference between him and the rest of us is he just had thousands of those pre-planned <laughs> things in his head that he could <laughs> he could just bring at a moment's notice. But if we're talking about truly exactly. creative, spontaneous, creative improvising, 
there just isn't a lot of that if we no. think about it as at that furthest extreme of creativity. I love and I think it will be inspirational for others to hear that even you were scared to do this and that it is OK to plan out some of your licks and things like that in advance if it's going to make it seem a little bit less scary. Yeah, a thousand percent. The Shebop initiative, could someone duplicate that in a different state? Do you have information about what you did? And if someone wanted to basically copy that, is that doable? Totally, totally. I've actually been talking um, with some folks in Texas about duplicating it there. And it's something I, I would love to kind of dig into more. I mean, I wrote this, you know, 70 page paper, a big chunk of it, including detailed things about the pedagogy and the schedule and why I do this and why you don't see this kind of thing in any other jazz camps, but why it's proven really important for the, um, for the young women who participate. So yeah, that's something I'm really open to. I know there's other kind of uh, women in jazz initiatives that folks are doing across the country, but I do think Shebop is really unique. Uh, one thing that makes us unique is our near peer mentor model. So I have, I bring in young women who've like recently graduated from high school or who are in college or who are maybe just like in their early twenties playing, starting to play professionally. And they're kind of embedded in the fabric of the camp. And I think having two layers of female mentorship is just, it's, it's so huge. You know, for, for me being someone who had no female mentors, it's, um, I can just see how impactful it is for, for women to feel like they have a place, the young women to feel like they have a place in the music. Also, I will say, you know, our, the, the workshop is open to non-binary students too. And, and uh, so, you know, no matter really if someone's identifying, like we, it's just, it is very inclusive in that way. But I always mention to non-binary folks who want to join, just so they know, this is focused on women. And this is kind of the, the, um, the framework for it. Are there any other things that music teachers might be doing, even inadvertently, that could be discouraging women and girls from participating in their school jazz programs? I think going back to the instruments, not only just like leaving the genderization thing aside, I love it when I see, a, you know, I'm adjudicating a jazz festival and I see a middle school or high school jazz band and there's non-traditional jazz instruments in there. You know, if someone is excited about playing in your ensemble, you know, a young woman who plays the flute or who plays the violin, or I think opening the doors to that, of course, it means more challenge for the directors. Um, we're starting to, to put some flex charts up on our Brava website. Um, actually, just have one that's going to go live today um, that allows directors to like who to maybe include some of these non-traditional instruments. What's the name of the chart? We'll give it some free, free uh, publicity. Oh, that's awesome. It's called Butterscotch. It's a, it's a peace of mind. It's a funky tune and it, it's accessible. If you, if your group has four musicians in it, you can play Butterscotch. But if you have 30, I've played it with, with a ensemble as big as like 34 um, and, and split up the different parts. And I've had all sorts of instruments, bassoon and euphonium play it. So yeah, I think just increasing the accessibility can be huge and, and offering, you know, young women the chance to improvise too and offering everyone in your ensemble the, the chance to improvise and really trying to break up who's who's soloing. It's always kind of a drag when you're at a concert, you know, you're an adjudicator and you're, you're seeing the same tenor saxophonist get up and solo for every single of their selections. And I'm like, I want to hear, I want to hear the gal who's playing the Barry sax, you know? And um, so that's easier said than done. But I think, um, you know, just bringing a little awareness to, to including those young women who are in your program. I feel like middle school teachers are doing a pretty good job nationwide these days of, oh, you play the flute. Yep. You can, I have music for you. Come in, come and play. Uh, totally. clarinet, cool. Uh, oh, I've got nine trumpets. That's fine. Um, I feel like high school and college directors, I've got eight trumpets in my jazz band, one flute. Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I'll, cause my thinking now is there are a lot of things that are important about jazz, being creative, learning about swing, learning about the tradition of the people, the one on a part instrumentation of the new Testament big band, like that's cool. And that's yeah. important. But for me, that doesn't really crack the top five for why we would be teaching jazz. So why would we exclude someone who and I was not this way 20 years ago. Um, mm. And so I'm I'm glad to have yet another reason to make it more inclusive for all the instruments 
is we're likely to to do a better job of solving some of these gender disparity issues, which I that had not occurred to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I ask you a few lightning round questions on some lighter topics, Annie Booth? Absolutely. Would be delighted to. What is your favorite restaurant in Denver these days? My favorite restaurant in Denver is a pizza spot. It's called Cart Driver Pizza. There's two locations in the city of Denver. It's the best pizza in Denver. It's uh, Neapolitan. It's sourdough. It's uh, they have a you know 900 degree oven. It's out of this world. They also make homemade pasta. Amazing wine list. My friend is the chef, so that you know he he's a, a jazz bass player who became a chef. So um, that's my recommendation. A piece of music, composer, or performer that you wish more people knew about. The Brazilian composer, pianist, vocalist, Johnny Alf. So Johnny Alf is a a name that flies way under the radar for a lot of folks. Um, I love Brazilian music. I've been kind of really in a Brazilian music rabbit hole the past six months or year. So Johnny Alf is uh, really by a lot of people largely considered the true father of Bossa Nova. Um, He wrote Bossa Nova compositions like a whole decade before the ones that we kind of cite as like, oh, this is Bossa Nova. And folks like Joe Beam and Gilberto have said on record, we, Johnny Alf is our guru. Like we learned everything from him. So he was like, he was enamored by jazz, um, kind of obsessed with Frank Sinatra. Um, And uh, in the 1950s and, and 60s, and he has a record called Rapage de Bem uh, and a great piece called Rapage de Bem, which I love playing. Um, it's just the orchestration is so neat and interesting and and funky and the compositions are just so fluid. And so Johnny Alf, ALF, that's my recommendation. I wish more people, I, I make my students, you know, do a deep dive uh, into Johnny Alf. So I, that's my, that's my name. <laughs> How about a favorite film or a TV series you've enjoyed recently? So uh, my husband and I like watching a lot of horror uh, movies and scary stuff this time of year, you know, around Halloween. So we watched a brand new um, horror film called Talk to Me, which was very scary (laughs) and uh, did give me a little bit of uh, some nightmares. But um, and then we watched uh, we watched a kind of, you know, a classic in the modern era vampire film, Let the Right One In. I hadn't seen it. I don't know if either of you guys have seen it. It's from like 2008. It's a Swedish vampire movie. It's It was great. It was fantastic. You know, not as uh, gory and, and horror as Talk to Me, which was which was very much <laughs> like that. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I just love this time of year. You know, we watch The Shining and just kind of do our classics. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed the, both of those films recently. How about the most memorable live music performance you have attended? The most memorable ever is uh, very hard to pinpoint, although I will say it was New York City, 2010, summer 2010, Maria Schneider Orchestra at Birdland. So I was in college at the time and my dad took me, um, I think my dad was on a business trip and I got to kind of go with him to New York and um, I'm good friends and and have been men- been lucky to be mentored by Greg Gisbert, great trumpet player who plays in Maria's band and has basically since the very beginning. And uh, Gizzy, as we call him, he got me and my dad into the rehearsal, into the sound check. Um, and I was, I've been long obsessed with Maria Schneider. She's the reason I, I'm a composer, you know, going back to talking about how important it is to see women composers. Like she was it for me that I saw her perform for the first time. And I was like, I want to do that. So just getting to be there for the sound check that night was so special. We sat in the front row right behind Maria. I got, I was like, you know, two, three feet away from her conducting. And at the time she had recently released her Grammy award-winning album, Sky Blue. She has a piece called Cerulean Skies on there. I don't know if you you are familiar with it or some of your listeners are. Um, And it has these bird calls that happen in the piece. Um, And she emulates bird sounds with her orchestra, but she had planted several people in the audience to have like actual bird calls. And um, she gave one to me. And uh, and it was a warbler uh, bird call and you have to fill it up with water in order to get the warbling Mm. sound. Mm -hmm. And in between shows, we stayed for both shows in between shows. She gave me the warbler and said, I want you to do this on the second set. 
And I was like, oh my God, cool. And she said, do you want to come to the bathroom with me really fast? Let's fill it up with water. And so I'm in the bathroom at Birdland, you know, I'm 20 years old and I'm with my hero and we're filling up the bird, you know, the bird call with water. And, uh, and she let me keep it. So I still have it. Um, and it's on my piano and it's just, it's like this little totem of, of inspiration. So God, that's gotta be the most memorable <laughs> concert. And of course the music was just like glorious. So. And finally, a book recommendation and special bonus if it doesn't have anything to do with music. So um, one writer, I'll kind of suggest an, an author. Um, her name's Otessa Moshfeg, O-T-T-E-S-S-A. Um, if you just look Otessa, she her stuff is very um, weird <laughs> and imaginative. And I've, I read, she has maybe five or six novels out. And I, I read one of her most famous ones, which is called uh, My Year of Rest and Relaxation. I read that at the beginning of this year and uh, after I just went on a kick and went ahead and read all, her entire catalog. Um, it's definitely bizarre. So, you know, it's you got to be kind of down for a little bit of surrealism, a little bit of um, just wonky stuff happening. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed learning more about her and I get it. she'll be definitely an author that I'll be following and to see when, what she next writes. Annie Booth, you are inspirational in so many ways for so many folks, and you will be so for our listeners. We're so thankful and grateful that you have uh, chosen to visit with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Alan and Steve. It was really such a pleasure to talk with you guys today. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Insights. We're supported by Group Dynamic, a leading provider of youth leadership workshops. Alan works with dozens of schools each year to help develop their leaders. Learn more at groupdynamic.net slash youth hyphen leadership. Or you could email me at alan at groupdynamic.net. Also sponsored by the Co College Music Education Program. They've got a website too. Just click their link at our website or email me at shanley at coe.edu. Also, the normal design, helping normal companies and people create memorable, meaningful, and professional designs and branding. More at thenormaldesign.com. And Winterset Websites, website design and maintenance. Wintersetwebsites.com. Our Facebook page is Music Ed Insights. Our website has has program notes, links, and a one-page download of this episode's key takeaways. That's musicedinsights.com. New episodes generally drop every couple weeks on Monday. Get current. Stay relevant. Music Ed Insights. Music Ed Insights.